Today, we are installing a one-of-a-kind dual battery system that you may never have even heard of. It's compact, lightweight, and extremely powerful. 55 amps, that's it. And we're doing it all here in the shed. All right, so I'm super keen because today we are finally getting started on the camping fit out on the patrol. Uh, and we're starting with the 12 volt system. So I've been hanging to do this for a long time. Uh, so we've gone and bought a few goodies. As you can see, one of the main components of your 12 volt system is your battery. Uh, and in this case, I've gone and bought myself a budget lithium. Uh, this is a King's battery, got it on sale for like $3.99 or something absolutely ridiculous. It's 100 amp hours, it's uh, slimline, so it's gonna be really easy to mount. and. The whole idea behind buying Kings was, well, I've seen Paddy use his for like two years now and he hasn't had an issue, so I figured I'm willing to give it a go for the price. So we're gonna fit this thing up. Uh, we've got a few more things as well, chargers and that, that's, we've got some pretty cool um, sort of charging systems happening too. Uh, but the first step is to figure out where this thing's actually gonna mount on the car. So let me show you what my plans are. So my biggest consideration when thinking about mounting up this 12 volt system was where on earth am I gonna stick this battery? Now, my previous lead acid second battery was mounted in the engine bay, but particularly with the lithium batteries now, they're not rated for the engine bay heat, particularly the King's one that I've bought. Uh, so I knew straight away that the engine bay was not gonna be an option for mounting. Now, the next spot I considered was mounting it in the cab. Now, a lot of people with single cabs or dual cabs will manage to mount their battery behind the seat on the rear wall. Uh, but unfortunately, in the old GQ, space isn't really at a luxury and even looking at some of the thinnest batteries on the market, it just wasn't gonna fit behind the seats. So straight away I knew that wasn't gonna be an option. So the next obvious option, and a lot of people do this, is stick the second battery system in your canopy. Now, I will be getting a canopy for this very, very soon, um, and it does make it super easy to wire up and it keeps it all out of the weather. Um, but in my case, I wanna be able to lift the canopy on and off, and I didn't want that to also limit whether I had a 12 volt system in the car or not. I want it to be fixed on the car permanently so I can lose the canopy and still strap a fridge on the tray. Uh, and so in taking all that into account, a battery in the canopy just wasn't gonna work for me. So after considering all that, I had to think to myself, where on earth am I gonna stick this thing? And the only option, and realistically the best option, is to stick it up under the tray. Now, I've got a bunch of room under there, even with the plans for fuel tanks and water tanks that I do have, and so this was the perfect sort of battery to fill out that space, and it's one of the big reasons why I went for a slimline, because it tucks perfectly up under the floor, it doesn't hang down, uh, and funnily enough, it fits perfectly between the rails that run widthways along the tray. It's like a super awesome fit. Uh, and so with that, it was the perfect spot to mount it. Now, the biggest thing to consider when mounting any sort of electrical appliance outside of your vehicle is that it's gonna be exposed to all the elements, and that includes water, dust, mud, uh, sand, vibrations, climate, all sorts of things. Um, and this battery doesn't have ratings for any of those things. Uh, so me and Paddy sort of looked at it and were like, I reckon we can make this thing a bit more weatherproof. Um, it appears that there's only one area in which water can sort of get in uh, between the lid and the bottom casing. So as a precaution, we're probably gonna run like a bead of silicon around there. Obviously that may not fully waterproof it, but I don't really plan to have this submerged for you know more than the length of a small river crossing, uh, ideally. And if the car was submerged above the floor of the tray for longer than that, then I've probably got bigger issues on my hands than what my $400 battery is doing. So with that being said, we're gonna start making up some mounting brackets for this thing so we can get it fixed up under the tray. So let's get stuck into it. A huge benefit of lithium batteries is their reduced weight. This slimline battery only weighs about 11 kilos and so I felt pretty confident in making a battery tray that could easily support it. I wanted to make sure that the tray was a snug fit around the battery and this would make sure that the battery can't vibrate and move about once it's mounted. Come like that. I'm planning on using high gauge tech screws to mount the battery tray as welding brackets to the ute tray without removing it would have been very difficult. Don't look at the welds too closely. What do they say? A grinder and paint makes me the welder I ain't. So with my somewhat average looking battery tray complete, we could give it a little bit of a clean up and a fresh coat of black paint and it was ready to mount under the tray. All right, it's got the battery tray all painted up. It's not the prettiest in the world, but it is strong and it's gonna do what we need to. It's gonna hold the battery up under the tray securely. Uh, before we chuck that in, the next most important part is the chargers. So in this case, I've gone and picked out some C-Tech chargers. Uh, so I've got the D250 SE 
and also got the SmartPass 120. Now these can actually be used individually or they can be used in conjunction, which is what I'm gonna be doing. Uh, and when they're used together, it allows you to do, you know, all your smart charging, that sort of stuff, as well as doing it at a very high rate, which is the key sort of thing. So assuming your alternator and battery can handle it, these can charge it up to 140 amps, which is pretty nuts. Uh, thinking about it, like if you've got a low battery, chuck the car and charge for an hour, happy days. Um, but we'll show you exactly how that all works shortly. Uh, and I'm gonna be able to do so with the Victron Smart Shunt that I'm also gonna be using. And this is gonna allow me to monitor the current in and out of the battery off my phone. Uh, so we can see exactly what these things are doing once we've got them in the car. Now it's gonna be mounted in the cab. I wanted to keep it out of the weather uh, and just easy to access. So mounting it in the cab, hopefully on a 12 volt panel behind the seat. So that's what we're gonna make up now. Uh, there might be a little bit of stuffing around getting it to mount, but it should all fit in there nicely. So let's get stuck into it. So I wanted this panel to cover the whole width of the cab. And luckily there is no shortage of plywood in our shed. And so finding something sturdy but light was no issue. I had to notch the bottom of the panel to fit the profile of the floor. This was easily done with a few rough measurements. So we're gonna make up some brackets now, and for those of you that might remember, we're gonna be using some leftover aluminium. Because the panel is sitting on the floor of the cab, these brackets only need to hold it upright and do not need to support its weight. To secure the panel, I'd be using riv nuts into the inner layer of the cab. All right, so we're gonna carpet the board. Now this is the leftover marine carpet that Patrick used when he made all these storage dividers in the 80 series. Uh, and we've got like a, well, more, than, more than we need left, but yeah, pretty much perfect amount. So we're gonna sit this essentially and just cut out, which will be pretty easy. To fix the carpet, we're using a spray adhesive that has worked really well on our projects in the past. I also use tacks on the folded edge to help secure it. Very nice. All right, so I've just pulled the board back out of the patrol and I was just messing around with where all the electronic components are best gonna fit because it is quite tight in there when I have the seat pressed up against the back of the cab. Um, so what you see here is pretty much the best position that I've found for it. So the SeaTech chargers are just sat here on the side sort of behind the driver's seat. Um, they are shifted up from the bottom of the cab, so they're not gonna be prone to, you know, if any water gets in there. And they all fit up really nicely together. When you use them in conjunction, the kit actually comes with a set of bus bars, uh, and that makes sure that it's all neatly uh, and securely joined together, and you've got a good connection between it, because after all, there is a lot of power running through these chargers. Next up, I've also placed our smart shunt next to the negative terminal on the charger, so that means Everything coming off the battery will be running, or through the system will be running through the shunt uh, so I can get a correct reading on my phone. Uh, and I've also gone and placed our inline fuse holder just down here, which just is nice and neat, a not, nice neat spot where I can run short cables to it. Um, and it all should just look neat and not take up too much room. So with that all sitting where I'm happy, uh, we'll start fixing them down and securing them. Uh, and then we can start doing some wiring. Now, with any 12 volt system, it's important you use the correct gauge wire and fuses. Most electronic components have a recommended wire gauge and fuse size, and it's important to follow these to keep your 12 volt system safe. If you're gonna tackle creating your own 12 volt system yourself, make sure you use the correct size lugs, heat shrink, and a crimping tool to ensure a safe, reliable system well into the future. We also drilled and cut some pass-through holes in the board so that I could neatly hide the cable behind the panel. All right, so we've got the board wired up. I'm actually super stoked with how it turned out. It's obviously, there is a lot of cables to run, so you can only make it so neat, but I think we've done pretty well uh, for how many cables we've had to run. Um, now the next step is pretty much, well, before we chuck this into the car, I really want to get the battery now mounted up under the tray so that we can start working out our lengths uh, to run our cable from the batteries, both the uh, starter and the secondary into the panel. So we'll probably go and stick the battery up under the tray uh, and then we can sit this in there and then start running lengths and then before we know it, it should be done. We placed the battery into its new battery tray and made sure to use rubber sheets on the top and bottom to dampen vibration and prevent wear. Then we could secure it under the tray. We then ran the cables from the battery itself through a grommet in the cab and behind the 12 volt board to be terminated at the chargers. 
For fusing the main connection from the starter battery to the SeaTech, I'm actually using a mega fuse and I'm using a 300 amp one, which is what's listed in the SeaTech manual. I finished off the last of the wiring and then we could secure the panel to the cab with the custom brackets made. And with a final tightening of all the terminals, we're ready to go. All right, so we've got our panel all mounted up to the back of the cab, that's all secured. And we've got all our components now wired up and we've actually got a few lights flashing on the chargers. Um, before I throw the seats back in, I'm gonna run you through the sort of system in its entirety because as you can see, there's actually a little bit going on. So let me run you through it. So first we'll begin with these two chargers. Now you're probably wondering why on earth do I need two chargers in this setup? Well, let me explain. So this is the SeaTech D250SE. Now this is a DC-DC charger that takes power from your alternator. It can also take power from solar via the MPPT and outputs it to your secondary battery at a rate of 20 amps. Now connected to the DC-DC charger via these bus bars is the SmartPass 120. And what this does is allows the whole system to run current into your second battery at a much higher rate. So as you can see here, we've got an output to the secondary battery as well as an output for consumers, which is capable of being powered by either the alternator or the secondary battery. And coming off the chargers, I've got a DC outlet. I've got my solar input. I've also got a six-way fuse panel, which I'm gonna to use to run accessories in the cab in the future. I've also got my Victron Smart Shunt, which is monitoring all the current coming in and out of the system. And most importantly, this whole thing is all fused. So with all that in, theoretically, this system is capable of charging my secondary battery at 140 amps, which you might be thinking that's a way bit overkill for a 100 amp hour battery, but it's actually exactly why I wanted this system. For the style of camping I do, which I'm generally only in a place for maybe two or three nights at most, I didn't need that extra 200 amp hours of battery with all that extra weight, room, and not to mention cost, when I can drive to the next campsite for only an hour and charge my battery back to 100%. However, if you want to use this system to its full potential like I do, you've got to make sure the rest of the car's 12 volt is up to scratch. Now, when we first got it wired up, me and Paddy were doing some testing and we could only get 20 amps through to the second battery. And after doing a bit more testing and a bit of searching around, we quickly realized that we were actually being limited by the vehicle's factory wiring. Now, this alternator here is only rated at up to 70 amps, so instantly that's already a limitation of the system. But even worse than that is the cable that was coming off it and running to my starter battery. Both the cable size and the terminal were like way undersized, uh, and as soon as we ran a new alternator cable to the battery, we instantly saw an improvement in our charging capacity. Oh! <laughs> Let's go! Let's go! Oh, man. That's it. Let's do it. So that's your old data maxed out. That would yeah, be your old data maxed out. 110 amp old data man. Oh, that is awesome. Also, never overlook earthing because that will affect your ability to charge at max capacity. Now, with all that sorted, let's pull up the Victron app and actually show you this thing working. All right, so we've got the Victron Connect app open, and as you can see there, we've got a few readings already on the display. We've got the voltage, we've got the current, we've got the power, we've got the consumed amperage, and also a time remaining value. Now, don't pay too much attention to that last one, as well as the state of charge, because these batteries are actually sitting at about less than 50%, so that has to be calibrated once we charge it. Um, but for now, you'll be able to see that if I go to plug a phone in uh, to this secondary battery port just out here, we're gonna start drawing a charge, so it's using about half an amp. Um, so yeah, but it's pretty instant, works well, which is awesome. Um, but I guess the next major thing we want to see is what happens when we actually turn the car on. So let's uh, turn the ignition on. All right, so let's turn her over. It'll take a second for the uh, charger to kick in once it registers signal from the alternator. All right, here we go. All right, and straight away you'll see that at the start we've got 23.7 amps coming through, 24 amps. Um, this will probably climb up a little bit. Now, watch what happens when I actually turn the revs up on the car. Obviously at idle, the alternator's not spinning that fast, uh, but when I turn the revs up, we should see an increase in amperage. And straight away like that, we've already jumped up to 50 amps. Oh, that's noisy. <laughs> so, Essentially here, the limitation of the system is the alternator. So we've got 50 amps coming through, but it is only a 70 amp alternator. And some of that power does have to go to other accessories in the vehicle. Um, and so I think a bigger alternator, potentially over 100 amps, uh, is gonna be the next upgrade. And that's gonna give me that much higher charging rate. 
So as you can see here on the Smart Pass, we have lights showing to indicate it is charging. And we also have lights on the D250SE to indicate that it's charging as well. So combined, they'll charge like this until the battery nears full capacity. And then it will drop back to just the D250SE on its own, just to trickle charge that last bit up to 100%. So I definitely think the next upgrade for me is gonna be a larger alternator, hopefully something around 120 or 140 amps, and that should allow me to charge the battery at over 100 amps, which that's gonna let me charge that 100 amp King's battery in an hour, which I think is unheard of with any other chargers. Like I know Paddy has to charge his for I think four hours or so to get a full charge, but I will just be able to rip around for an hour and before I know it, full battery again. All right, so I've got the seats back in and super stoked with how it turned out. As you can see, you can hardly, well, as you can't see, you can't even see the 12 volt setup, but just with the flick of a chair, all of a sudden everything's exposed, easy to get to. And the same goes for the battery as well. Super well hidden up under the tray and there's actually the perfect amount of room right next to it to connect another one of the same batteries in parallel. So if I do ever want to expand the 200 amps, that is really easy to do. So super happy with how this setup ended up turning out. And honestly, I just can't wait to go out and actually use it. I can't wait to stick a fridge on the back, you know, do a few little things, particularly getting the canopy on with all the accessories inside there and really give this system a good test out. But uh, yeah, if you enjoyed this episode, make sure you give it a like, comment down below your thoughts if I stuffed anything up. <laughs> but um, other than that, give a subscribe and uh, cheers. We'll see you in the next one.